pleasure to have you all with tonight to talk about mankind's greatest adventure, Apollo Reaches the Moon. Quite a topic. So much I want to tell you. And of course, our time is limited. Now, I realize, first of all, that many of you probably have some understanding, some knowledge of the Apollo program, but probably many of you don't. And that's why you're here tonight. So I'd like to share that with you, of course. To do that, I want to give you a little bit of background information. I want to give you a little bit of context so that you can really appreciate the magnitude of this accomplishment. And so I want to take you back to the 1950s to start out. Picture the 1950s. Now, this is the time of the Cold War. The United States, the Soviet Union, they're vying for supremacy. Both are nuclear powers. They have nuclear weapons. And at first, these would be delivered using aircraft, but both realized the importance, really the strategic and the tactical advantage, if they could use rocket technology to do that. They would gain the upper hand. And so both were hard at work during the 1950s to advance their rocket technology. Both knew that a first big step in that regard would be if they could demonstrate and put a satellite in orbit around the Earth. That would require quite a bit of uh, progress, be quite an accomplishment. Well, some of you might know that the uh, Soviet Union was the first to do that. October 1957, they launched Sputnik into space and frankly, shocked the United States. We realized we were behind. And even though the United States was able to orbit their own satellite shortly thereafter, as you see in January 1958, there was great concern that this could easily escalate into, again, a arms type of race. Fortunately, I think a very wise move was made. The United States created NASA in October of 1958, the National Aeronautics Space Administration, as a civilian agency to pursue space. And NASA's goal was exactly that, to explore space. Both sides knew that the next big step would be to put humans into space. And so both began working on that. Now, as you'll see in just a minute, there was another significant event that happened at that time. But the Soviet Union was first to put a human into space in April of 1961. Once again, surprising the United States, which was almost ready, but not quite. The United States did place their first national into space just a few weeks later in May of 1961. And at that time, President Kennedy, whom you see here, was very concerned, of course, about the fact that the Soviet Union seemed to be ahead of us in space technology. And so he called his advisors and said, how do we catch the Soviet Union? How do we surpass the Soviet Union in space technology? The answer was, it's not going to happen anytime soon we have some catching up to do, so to speak. And so they got to work on that and tasked NASA with, again, a program for human space flight. After the first human space flight here in the United States in May of 1961, only a few short weeks after that, President Kennedy took a very bold, very dramatic step. Some of you might be aware of this. He gave a speech in which he challenged the United States to a very audacious, difficult goal. He said, and I quote, I believe this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. Now at the time, the United States had an entire total of 15 minutes of space flight. So this again was a very challenging goal that he set out. Would the nation respond? Would Congress respond? Well, it turned out the answer was yes. So that sets the stage for us to talk about the early space missions of the United States, the early space program, Project Mercury. Here you see on the left, first of all, the first seven Mercury astronauts selected from the nation's test pilots. In the center and on the right, you see the tiny Mercury capsule. One would fit up on the stage here in which they would go into space. Now, Project Mercury's objectives were fairly simple. Develop the techniques, the ability, really the operations to put astronauts into space for up to about 24 hours. 
Well, it turned out that Project Mercury was a great success. Six flights were flown during 1961 and 1963. The, the first two flights were what were called suborbital flights, where they did not place the astronaut into orbit around the Earth, but merely lofted him to an altitude of approximately 115 miles and then recovered him. But this was no small feat in itself. It wasn't as simple as a matter of building a rocket and a capsule and training your astronaut. No, launch capabilities had to be devised, communications, tracking, recovery, so much that had never been done before. You and I live in the space age and we may take these things for granted, but these things had to be invented, developed, tested, before you would risk a man's life. As you can see on the left here, the first two flights, as I mentioned, were suborbital flights using a smaller rocket called the Redstone. It didn't have the power to accelerate the spacecraft into orbit. And yet it would, they were two very successful flights, again in the spring and summer of 1961. It wasn't until February of 1962 that the rocket you see on the right there, the Atlas, was used to take the Mercury capsule into orbit the first being uh, astronaut John Glenn. So at this point, the United States was making progress. Frankly, the Soviet Union was still pushing ahead and still seemed to be in the lead. So again, the Mercury program was very successful. It set out various objectives and met those objectives, again, during 1961 and 1963. Well, of course, NASA realized their goal was much bigger. If we were to go to the moon, number one, they need additional astronauts. Number two, they need additional facilities. Number three, they need to vastly increase their launch, tracking, communication capabilities. All those things had to be put in place. Again, you and me take that for granted, but they had to be developed and invented. So during these years, NASA was again busy hiring and training astronauts. They developed the next program in sequence for American space flight project Gemini. This would be a two-man mission, as you see a larger version of the capsule here. And you can see the objectives. Number one, not only to orbit two astronauts, but for a much longer period of time. NASA already knew that to get to the moon and back in the long term, they would need space flights of approximately 10 to 14 days. And so they had to learn how to do that. Number two, the early Mercury missions simply used the booster to send the spacecraft into orbit and it stayed in that orbit until it was time to come down. Well, NASA had decided by this point in time that in order for us to get to the moon, we would need the ability for two spacecraft to meet in space. Now that might not sound very difficult. If you know where one is, launch the other one towards it, not trivial. Orbital mechanics dictate many factors involved here. The timing, the altitude, the velocity, all these various things came into play. So it was not a trivial thing to talk about one spacecraft meeting another in space, but it had to be done. Number three, after the spacecraft had made this rendezvous and reached the same orbit at the same place at the same time, they would need to be able to physically dock together. Why? Because NASA was already foreseeing that when we went to the moon, two spacecraft would need to do that. One would remain in orbit around the moon. Another would be the one that would actually land with two of the astronauts. And when it returned, again, they would need to physically dock so the astronauts could transfer back. The final piece that Gemini uh, attacked was really to walk in space or to leave the spacecraft. NASA knew that once we reached the moon, we wanted the astronauts to get out and take a moonwalk, gather samples, do other experiments. So again, we needed to develop the ability to work in space. So from 1965 through 1966, the Gemini missions were launched, some with a kind of new group of astronauts, highly trained, carefully planned missions, and they did accomplish these objectives. Although I will tell you there were a few scary moments. There were some ch challenges, there were some difficulties, and this was really the point, was NASA had to learn how to overcome these challenges, and they did exactly that. Some of those missions were as short as just a few hours, others did last for two weeks. Now, if you noticed in our previous slide, it's not a real big spacecraft, is it? So imagine two astronauts 
sitting side by side, much like you might sit in the front two seats of your car for two weeks. <laughs> How would that go? They had to be pretty good friends, you know? <laughs> but they did it. They did it. And again, accomplished the various objectives of the program. In the center picture here, you see our first astronaut in space, Ed White, in 1965, left the Gemini capsule. And again, this was not a trivial thing, as later astronauts found out when they left the spacecraft. It's very difficult to control your motion when you're floating in space here. Well, Project Gemini proceeded quite well overall during those two years. NASA again continued to train other astronauts. They were already working on the Apollo program at this point. Of course, it would require an even larger spacecraft. In fact, as you'll see, it's going to require two different spacecraft. You can see my model here I'll talk about in just a minute. And of course, it would also require a far, far larger rocket to send those spacecraft to the moon. So let's talk about those two spacecraft. You see here on your left the Apollo Command and Service Modules. That conical-shaped uh, vehicle you see here is the command module. This is where the crew would live and work for the duration of the mission. Frankly, it was the only part of the uh, vehicle that would come back to Earth when all was said and done. But you also see this cylindrical service module. Here, of course, you'd have not only propulsion, you see the large rocket engine in the rear, but you'd need to have fuel for it. It would need to generate power. It would need to be able to send both spacecraft properly into lunar orbit. And then most importantly, it would need to be able to send them out of lunar orbit on their way back to Earth. So that was obviously a very critical spacecraft. At the time, this was by far the most complex spacecraft that had ever been devised, and it required quite a bit of testing to get it right. On your right, you can see the lunar module, and I've deliberately tipped it on its side to show you how the two would dock together. If you look closely, you'll notice the gold descent stage of the lunar module. This is the part that would have the engine that would allow the astronauts to break from lunar orbit down to the surface. However, once they had done that, its use was fulfilled, only this other left-hand part, where the astronauts themselves were, would lift off the moon and head back up to rendezvous with the command module for the ride home. The lunar module was, again, a very complex spacecraft. One of the great uh, restrictions on this spacecraft was that it had to be very light. Imagine trying to design something for two men to land on the moon, carrying all of their life support, communications, propulsion, all that, and it only gets to be 8,000 pounds in weight. That might sound like a lot to you and me, but it was not much to work with. And so the engineers really had a difficult task to get that spacecraft to where it needed to be. So these were the spacecraft that, again, would take astronauts to the moon. Each had a specific role. Each, of course, again, had to be built, designed, tested before we could do that. How would it get there? Well, you probably are familiar with the Saturn rockets. Now, there was two versions I'll mention. I want to start out by mentioning the very first Apollo mission, later called Apollo 1, was a tragedy, a terrible tragedy. Three men gave their lives for the Apollo program. The Apollo 1 spacecraft was on the launch pad being tested on a Friday evening when a fire broke out inside of it and there was not time to get the astronauts out. So to this day, NASA still remembers those three astronauts, Gus Grissom, Ed White, Roger Chaffee, and the sacrifice they made, the price they paid for us to go to the moon. NASA, of course, was greatly shaken. The country was, uh, of course, very upset, and NASA set, up, set back to fixing the problem, to make sure that would never happen again. They realized that perhaps they had been moving a little too quickly and they needed to make a little more sure of how things were going to be going. So after a few unmanned test flights, the Apollo spacecraft, the command and service module, were ready to be tested in Earth orbit. That would be the first mission. And as you see here on the left, that would use what I kind of call the smaller version of the Saturn rocket, the Saturn 1B rocket. This was a very useful launch vehicle for many purposes. And for that first mission, it placed the Apollo Command Module Service Module into Earth orbit in October of 1968. So that mission was going quite well 
But meanwhile, the moon rocket. We would need an even larger booster, the Saturn V rocket, as you see on your right here. This was the largest rocket by far being developed to date. And to this day, it remains one of the largest rockets ever flown, one of the most powerful. How much? Well, let me go back for just one second and mention again these two spacecraft. When you total up their weight, the amount of weight you need to send to the moon, it was somewhere in the neighborhood of about 100,000 pounds. You can imagine even on Earth, that would take a lot of power to move that, right? Well, imagine now if you have to place those vehicles at a speed of 25,000 miles per hour. To give you some, exam uh, some example of that, that's about seven miles per second. So you can imagine the power required. Well, as you can see, it was an enormous booster. That first stage used five gigantic engines, each of which, when put together, totaled seven million pounds of thrust. What does that mean? That means 160 million horsepower. Can you imagine that? <laughs> There's been a lot of comparisons. I think one I remember was it was as much power as 85 times the Hoover Dam. That's a lot of power. Okay, so this enormous rocket, again, had to be designed, test flown, and made sure that it was ready before you would put men on it. After that first stage, lifted the vehicle to approximately 40 miles altitude and accelerated it to several thousand miles an hour. It would exhaust its fuel, it would drop away into the ocean, its job was done. Now this second stage would kick in and its five engines would continue to propel Apollo towards Earth orbit. These total about one million pounds of thrust and this stage would burn for several more minutes until Apollo reached approximately 15,000 miles per hour at an altitude of about 100 miles. That wasn't quite fast enough to have a sustained orbit, and so after that second stage drops away, the third stage fires with a single engine to place the remaining spacecraft into Earth orbit. It was thought a good idea to go into Earth orbit first, check out all of your spacecraft after this very violent launch. Above the third stage, you might be able to see a smaller section here where the lunar module, the lander, would be housed. Now, it was built in such a way that it was never meant to fly in the atmosphere. It was only meant to fly in the vacuum of space. And so here it was protected in this spacecraft adapter region. Finally above that would be the service module and the command module with the astronauts. And you see at the very top a small rocket launch escape tower that could pull them away if there was ever a major problem. So what a tremendous vehicle the Saturn V was, as we'll see. It proved to be an outstanding vehicle for its purpose. I mentioned just briefly that much more had to be done, didn't it? And so after those early Mercury flights, NASA embarked on a plan to greatly enhance their facilities. You see on the left here, the famous Kennedy Space Center. Maybe some of you have visited there. Here is where the Apollo rockets would be assembled. Here is where they would be launched. This is in Florida. And you can see this cubicle looking building here, the vehicle assembly building, huge, huge building where these rockets again would be assembled, placed on a mobile transporter. You see a Saturn V here on that transporter, which would then very slowly and carefully take the vehicle out to the launch pad for launch. Well, after launch, an entirely different control center would be needed. And you can see that on the right here, the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, known as Mission Control, or for the astronauts, just Houston. Maybe you have heard that. Here is where the brains of the mission were. Here is where the flight director, directors managed numerous flight controllers, each with a specific portion of the mission to be concerned about, whether it's guidance, propulsion, communications, power, environment, all of these things had to be coordinated under the direction of a flight controller. So I hope you get some sense of the magnitude of this endeavor. All of these things, again, had to be developed, designed, implemented, and put into place before you could go to the moon. How would they go to the moon? 
Well, in my diagram here, I want to just point out briefly to you some of the major steps. You can see kind of step one there as, the, again, the rocket lifts off from Earth, goes into Earth orbit. Finally, when all is checked out, that third stage of the rocket would ignite again and send Apollo on its way to the moon. We call that a translunar injection, or TLI. During this time, several days, the spacecraft are coasting towards the moon. They've reached that velocity of 25,000 miles an hour, but as they're heading towards the moon, the Earth's gravity is pulling them back and slowing them down a little bit. Eventually, they'd reach a point where the moon's gravity would become dominant and pull them closer. Here's where the Apollo Command Module and Service Module would dock. From the initial launch, the Command Module had to be released and turn around and come back to dock nose to nose, so to speak, with the Lunar Module for the remaining flight, after which the remaining booster section would be discarded. So again, these two spacecraft are the ones that would eventually make it to the moon. As they approach the moon, you can see in the next step there, the service propulsion engine on our service module would need to fire to properly place them into lunar orbit. Otherwise, they would typically swing around the moon once and the moon's gravity would direct them back to Earth. This was called a free return trajectory. Just in case anything went wrong, the spacecraft could automatically return with no further action, but normally they would again fire that engine and go into lunar orbit. Well, from that point forward, the real excitement begins. Now the lunar module will detach from the service module and command module. Two astronauts would then land it on the moon, perform their activities, and as I mentioned earlier, then the ascent part of the mission would come back up to dock with our command module for the return trip home. So this entire scenario was termed lunar orbit rendezvous. And you think, boy, it's kind of complicated. Why not just get a big rocket and go straight there and land, right? Well, NASA, of course, put a lot of time and thought into this, and they realized that this was the best scenario. This was the best choice for many reasons. It minimized the amount of power, fuel, and time that the astronauts needed to spend, and it minimized also, if you want to use that word, the size of the launch rocket. Any other type of mission would have required an even larger rocket than the Saturn V, which was already quite gigantic. So as I mentioned, in October of 1968, the Apollo Command and Service Module were first sent into Earth orbit for their first test, maybe call it a shakedown cruise, make sure everything works well, and that went very well. But about this time, NASA began growing concerned that the Russians might still be ahead of us and that they might try to score another first. In other words, they thought maybe they were going to send astronauts to the moon. NASA didn't want to be second again. So they made a very bold, a very daring decision. And I think in retrospect, you look back and you say, yeah, it was a brilliant decision because it worked. But the point is, were we ready to go to the moon yet? The next mission that was scheduled, Apollo 8, had been planned to test the lander, the lunar module, in Earth orbit. That probably made sense. But it wasn't ready yet. It was proving very difficult to finish the lunar module. But meanwhile, again, NASA was concerned, so they came up with an alternative mission for Apollo 8. They said, look, our command and service module already. We feel strongly that the Saturn V booster is ready because we've had several unmanned launches. Why not send Apollo 8 command and service module only to the moon? In other words, we'll hold off on the lunar module portion and that complexity those additional constraints. Let's send our astronauts away from Earth orbit. Well, again, a very bold and daring move at the time. I want to give you some sense of what that really meant. Let me do this. Up to this point in time, the various missions had, again, orbited Earth, as we discussed. And I'm going to go ahead and share with you a good old-fashioned 12-inch Earth globe, OK? Probably saw that many times in school. Now, at this scale, up to this point in time, our astronauts had reached an altitude of approximately 800 miles. That sounds pretty high, right? But our 8,000 mile diameter Earth at this scale means that those astronauts were orbiting approximately one inch above the Earth. 
you probably know where I'm going. Or rather, more correctly, where the astronauts were going. I'm going to show you also a scale model of the moon next to our Earth. How far away did the Apollo 8 astronauts intend to go? Really, really far. At this scale, they had to travel approximately 230,000 miles. I'm going to run out of stage here. Does that give you some idea what they were uh, attempting to do for the first time? These were brave men. These were also very intelligent mission controllers and planners to send our astronauts from the Earth to the moon and back. Now this, of course, would require that larger Saturn booster, that Saturn V booster. I mentioned it had been tested in an unmanned phase and it had performed well. But I want to share with you the launch of Apollo 8 because this, as I like to say, was a big deal for astronauts to leave the Earth. This would be the first time astronauts would ride that Saturn V, not only into Earth orbit, but then, as I mentioned, they would fire that engine again and send themselves to the moon. So let's go ahead and watch a video I have for you of the Apollo 8. 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, shaking was unbelievable. The vibration was so intense you couldn't see the instrument panel. I thought we'd had it uh, during the launch. I was hoping that Frank Borman didn't have his hand on the abort controller. He, he said he took his hand off and he'd rather die than make a false abort. One minute after liftoff, the Saturn V is already supersonic. Well, the Saturn V is still the most powerful machine that man has ever devised. 20 tons of fuel a second, seven and a half million pounds of thrust. I think we were all surprised at how strong that thing was. <laughs> it had had two or three iffy missions before ours, but it was a piece of cake. It just worked beautifully. Unbelievable. Engines in the first stage blast the Saturn V to seven times the speed of sound. The second stage cut in. Big bang. At 40 miles high, it's still accelerating. When you staged, you were throwing forward in the belts and then backward in the belts. And I thought I was being catapulted through the instrument panel. All sources show that the stage is burning perfectly. The third stage fires twice. First, the boost into orbit. The second burn takes the crew of Apollo 8 where no men have ever been. Deep. Quite a mission, quite an accomplishment. You might even recall, some of you, that when Apollo 8 went into orbit, it was uh, December 1968, right around Christmas time. And it was quite a memorable mission, as I mentioned. Why? Well, interestingly, I like the expression that one of the astronauts used, Bill Anders. He said, you know, we went to the moon to explore the moon, but we've discovered the Earth. What did he mean by that? Well, let me show you what he meant. One of the most profound, I think most breathtaking images ever made, at least to me, was the view that the astronauts had of our Earth floating in space. Up to this point in time, we hadn't seen something like that. But again, this had such an impact on not only them, but all of humanity. This was a special moment for humanity to see its fragile, precious planet floating in space. And it did give rise to many giving thought to that. Even way back then, that kind of kick-started the whole ecology movement. People started thinking about what we were doing to our planet. So it really was a profound moment, a highlight of the mission. They orbited the moon 10 times safely. They did fire the engine on their service module and return home safely. 
the first mission to go to the moon. So what a tremendous accomplishment Apollo 8 was. We sometimes overlook that based on some of the other missions. Well, by this point in time, NASA had again been working very hard to put all the pieces in place for a lunar landing. And again, this came back to the lander, the lunar module. So in March of 1969, the Apollo 9 mission was assigned to test the lunar module for the first time in Earth orbit. It was deemed a wise move, I think it was, to test it there, a little bit closer to home. And so it was for a number of days. The lunar module was tested. No, they're not upside down, but they just look upside down in this picture, taken from the command module and vice versa. Command module picture taken from the lunar module. So the Apollo 9 mission, again, was a very important step to test that vehicle out. Many elements were tested, not only the propulsion, communication, and guidance, but they moved into different orbits, as we mentioned earlier, to show that that could be done and then dock back together. At this point, people were getting excited. It seemed like all the pieces were falling into place. Would NASA now launch for the moon? Here they took a bit more caution. After the bold, daring Apollo 8 mission, they said, no, let's have one more test mission. Let's send Apollo 10 back to the moon so that we get more experience with that, and let's test the lunar module there before we try landing. In other words, let's run an entire mission before we endeavor to land. And that turned out to be a wise move as well. The mission overall went very well, accomplished its objectives, but there were, again, a few scary moments when the lunar module uh, caused some problems. Here's where very highly trained, highly skilled astronauts were essential. They were able to take control manually, right their ship, and get it back to dock with the service module, command module, so that, again, they basically found any remaining issues before attempting to land. Well, now the stage was set. Now the stage was set. As we moved into spring of 1969, again, the Apollo 10 mission is completed. Of course, for several months prior to this, the Apollo 11 mission was training, and that's kind of why we're here tonight, isn't it? To celebrate that tremendous accomplishment when it did all come together. So, July 1969, Apollo 11. You can see our astronauts here, Neil Armstrong, Michael Collins, Buzz Aldrin, highly trained, highly skilled pilots, each in their own right had been relentlessly tested and, again, trained for this mission. You see the magnificent liftoff of the booster there. By now, of course, these spacecraft had all kind of gained nicknames, and you're probably familiar with the fact that the command module was called Columbia and that lunar module, the Eagle. And so it was that the mission proceeded nicely. They flew to the moon, went into lunar orbit, and as you can see in the lower right there, the Eagle undocked. Neil Armstrong very excitedly said, the eagle has wings. What a great metaphor, huh? And so people were very excited about this. I have to tell you that in recent weeks and months, of course, I've been working very hard to prepare this for you, and it's been a fascinating, amazing uh, journey for me to learn so much more than I knew about these missions, about how the astronauts perform these maneuvers, about how they landed on the moon. I'll let you in on a little secret. If you go up to YouTube, there's some pretty cool videos, you know, okay? In fact, I'm going to share you a couple more. But the point is, I've also read some technical journals explaining how do you land on the moon. It's not trivial. And I'll just only very briefly give you a little taste of that. Basically, your lunar module, when it undocks from the command and service module, starts out face down to the moon, flying backwards. Why would they do that? Well, sooner or later, you've got to slow down. So the point is you're face down, so the commander can look straight down and see various landmarks, perhaps craters, and know where they are. Are we at the right place in the right time? And uh, they were. The, it, the engine fires. It begins to slow the spacecraft down. The spacecraft is now rolled upwards and is proceeding in this type of a fashion. Now, the computer is in control here of the flight. The two pilots, of course, are monitoring this. At some point, as the speed is dropping, the lunar module is going to begin falling more towards the surface. And again, they're in constant uh, 
contact with mission control, who is tracking them and talking to them about all the performance. And as the spacecraft now is approaching the surface, again, it begins to slow horizontally, but it needs to slow vertically. Again, a very complex landing. As you're going to see, Neil Armstrong had quite a challenging role being in control of the spacecraft. The computer could only do so much, and it turns out that as it pitched over and he could see where they were going, he could see the computer was taking them to an area that would not work. It was littered with huge boulders the size of cars. There would no, be no way for the fragile spacecraft to land there. Once again, here's where a skilled, trained, experienced test pilot comes into play. To take manual control, very limited fuel supplies, one chance to get this right. The only other option would be to abort the mission and separate the spacecraft and head back up without landing. So again, a very challenging role. Let's watch our next video. What you're going to see here on the right is more modern imagery of the surface. On the Eagle, you're looking great. Saw. Coming up nine minutes. We're now in the approach phase. Everything looking good. Altitude 5,200 feet. Manual attitude control is good. Roger, copy. Altitude 4,200. Houston, you're a go for landing. Over. I turn up there and go for landing. 3,000 feet. Top alarm. 1201. 1201. Roger. 1201 alarm. We're go. Same type. We're go. 2,000 feet. 2,000 feet. Into the ag. 47 degrees. Roger. 47 degrees. Eagle looking great. You're go. Altitude 1,600. 1,400 feet, still looking very good. Roger, 1202, we copy it. 35 degrees. 35 degrees, 750, coming down to 23. 700 feet, 21 down, 33 degrees. 100 feet, down to 19. 540 feet down at 30, and at 15. At 400 feet down at 9. Gate forward. 150 feet down at 4. 30, rip half down. They're, uh, pegged on, uh, Horizontal velocity. 300 feet down, three and a half. 47 forward. Hold up. On one and a one and a half down. 70. That big shadow out there. 50 down at two and a half. 19 forward. Altitude, velocity, light, three and a half down, 220 feet, 15 forward, 11 forward, coming down nicely, 200 feet, four and a half down, five and a half down, 160 feet, six and a half down, five and a half down, nine forward, good, and 20 feet. 100 feet, three and a half down, nine forward, 5%. How many bites? 875 feet, that's looking good, down a half. Six forward. 60 seconds. Bites on, six. Down two and a half. Forward, forward. 30 feet down, two and a half, picking up some dust. 30 feet, two and a half down, 
Great shadow. Four forward. Four forward. Drift into the right a little. Down and a half. 30 seconds. Forward. Okay. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. APA at a descent. Boat control, both auto, descent, engine command override off. Engine arm off. 413 is in. We copy you down, Eagle. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, Twink. Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. Thank you. You're looking good here. Okay, we're going to be busy for a minute. <laughs> That's how you land on the moon. And I'll point out just a couple of quick highlights there. I didn't want to interrupt, but uh, as he was descending, it might not have looked all that hard. But you heard, number one, some program alarms. The computer was flashing to the astronauts that it was having problems. You heard them say 1201, 1202, and back on the ground in Houston they could see that. And the computer was saying, I'm too busy, I'm really busy here doing a lot of things, I don't know. But the people on the ground, those mission controllers, realized what was happening and they were able to give them the green light, say it's okay, continue. You don't have to abort. The astronauts were very dependent on the mission controllers for that. You might have also heard, you saw Armstrong finish up coming over a very large crater right in his way. And uh, he basically had to, again, take control of his spacecraft that at the point was pretty much ready to land, but there's a crater in the way. So he had to continue moving in this direction quite a bit. Aldrin said, you know, you're going pretty fast forward. He's, he knew that. <laughs> but you might have also heard from the ground, they called out 60 seconds. And what they meant was, you have 60 seconds of fuel left before you run out. Okay, and Armstrong very coolly, calmly said, I know where I need to go. Maneuvered over that. In fact, there was one more call. They said 30 seconds before they would have to explosively blast away and save themselves. But later on, Armstrong made the comment. He said, I know how much fuel I had. So a very calm, confident, skilled pilot Okay. One of the problems they found out later was in this early lunar module, the fuel was kind of sloshing around, giving them different readings, made it difficult for him, but he was up to the task, ably assisted by his uh, lunar module pilot, Buzz Aldrin. So, a dramatic landing. Here's one of the pictures that Armstrong himself took looking back at the lunar module as Aldrin disembarks. And you see I mentioned there again those challenges that they faced before Armstrong could utter those famous words, the eagle has landed. And you gotta love what Mission Control said. Yeah, we're all turning blue here, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> so again, a very dramatic landing. This was Sunday afternoon, July 20th, 1969. And Apollo 11 was on the moon. Now, the flight plan had called for them, after all of this, to take a rest. Could you rest? <laughs> I don't think so. So they said, hey, uh, we have an idea. Maybe we could go on our moonwalk and then we'll rest later, right? And Mission Control could not argue with them. So they authorized them that very evening to take their moonwalk. And here again, you see an image as Aldrin is descending the ladder. And on the surface of the historic landing, you might have heard I'm sure we probably all have heard Neil Armstrong's famous words that this was a giant leap for mankind. And it really was when you stop and think about the accomplishment as we're, as we're talking about. So the astronauts spent a little over two hours out on the surface gathering lunar samples. I think you got to see one tonight. Priceless in the sense that not only are they very difficult to obtain, but the scientific information they would provide scientists truly was priceless. They left a seismometer to see if the moon was geologically active. They even left a special reflecting device that astronomers used for many years. Once they were safely home, astronomers would send a pulse of laser light to the moon and it would reflect back. And by measuring the time that it took 
and knowing the velocity of light, you could gauge the distance of the moon, you're not going to believe me, to within an inch. And this has allowed us to confirm something we suspected, that the moon is ever so slightly drifting away from Earth, about one inch per year. So that tells you, well, if you wind the clock backward, of course, long ago, the moon would have been much closer, and so on and so forth. But the point is a very valuable, even if passive, scientific experiment. Ultimately, of course, this very first landing, so much to do, but if nothing else, it proved that the astronauts could work on the moon. They could land on the moon. There had been many unknowns, and yet they were able to show that. So, how about we see one more video? Would you like to see the first moonwalk? Okay. Um, uh, at the foot of the ladder, the Lambert beds are only uh, uh, depressed in the surface about uh, one or two inches. Uh, although the surface appears to be uh, very, very fine-grained as you get close to it. It's almost like a powder. Ground mass uh, is very fine. Yep, and then a long one. Okay, I'm going to leave that one foot up there and... Uh... Both hands down about the fourth rung up. There you go. Okay, now I think I'll do the same. For those who haven't uh, read the plaque, uh, we'll read the plaque that's on the front landing gear of this lamb. There's, there's two hemispheres, one showing each of the two hemispheres of Earth. Underneath it says, Here men from the planet Earth, first set foot upon the moon, July 1969, AD. We came in peace, I guess you're about the only person around that doesn't have TV coverage of the scene. Okay, I'm going to leave that one foot up there, and I'll leave the other one up there. Oh, it's beautiful, Mike. It really is. Oh, geez, that's great. Is the lighting halfway decent? Yes, indeed. They've got the flag up now, and you can see the stars and stripes on the... How about that for an exciting moment? Again, you could see Armstrong descend the ladder first. This was a camera that was over on one of the sides of the lunar module looking up at the ladder that they came down, and then you saw Aldrin descend as well. You saw them out on the surface there, and then they read the plaque that was left on the lunar module. So again, a very exciting time for them to be able to go out and do the moonwalk as planned, uh, perform the various activities that had taken place at that time. So all in all, a very successful mission. They returned home, of course, to a very jubilant Earth mission control. All of the United States, really the whole world, celebrated this very special moment in time uh, if you notice some of the quotes I had up before we began our discussion, there were several of them that I think were profound, besides the maybe familiar ones. But if you noticed one, it said, you know, for one priceless moment, all the people of Earth were truly one. And I think that was true. People watched that on television and realized that here humanity had done this. Interestingly, too, here in the context of the Cold War that we described, the United States could have easily said, well, we came here to conquer the moon, and they didn't say that. They said, we came in peace for all mankind. So I think a very noble sentiment, one that served very well at that time. Well, by fall of 1969, NASA was ready to go again. They had planned a number of additional missions, and Apollo 12 was launched in November 1969. It started off with a problem, a very inauspicious start. It was struck by lightning the Saturn V booster, and this completely knocked out the computer aboard the command module where the astronauts were. They felt they were flying blind. But here is where that superb Saturn V booster guided itself into orbit. Now, the mission controllers 
recognize what was happening and one was able to realize what was happening and how to correct it relatively quickly and he did radio that up to the astronauts. They got into Earth orbit, they weren't so sure they were going anywhere after that, but they were cleared to go to the moon as you can see here. And so it was that Pete Conrad and Al Bean landed on the moon. And this time rather than just safely land, don't want to say it like that, but they were directed to try to land at a very pinpoint spot. Apollo 11 it turned out had gone a little bit long from where they uh, were planning to go, but here they wanted to land as you see in this picture near an unmanned spacecraft that had landed there a couple years previously and they did it. They were able to locate and land right near this surveyor spacecraft. Clipped off a few parts to bring home for study, but it proved as you see the lunar module in the distance there that they could decide exactly where to land so that in later missions when they were given that task, that assignment, the astronauts could land at a precise uh, location for whatever reason. Well, by spring of 1970, NASA was ready to fly again, and I'll bet some of you are familiar with this mission. Apollo 13 did not land on the moon. How many have seen the movie? That's what I thought. Brilliantly done movie, of course, showing the uh, problem, of course, that befell Apollo 13. On its way to the moon, an oxygen tank explodes. This basically rendered the entire service module unusable. The astronauts lost their power, their air, their consumables, their electricity, all that, and the use of that engine. What would they do now? Well, here is where mission control came in. And you might remember the famous phrase of one of the mission directors. He said, failure is not an option. You will not let these men die. You will find a way to get them home. How would they do that? Well, you probably know the story. It was the lunar module that was pressed into service, what they called the lifeboat scenario. It had power, it had propulsion, it had guidance, and so completely changed the mission. Mission control had to direct them on how to do this. The astronauts endured great hardship, but were able to use the lunar module to get themselves once around the moon and on their way back to Earth and the mission was later called a successful failure. I like that, a successful failure. Saving those men's lives by not only their skill, but again, mission control. So for the very few that maybe haven't seen the movie, we recommend it, of course. But what a tremendous uh, mission that was to save the astronauts. Of course, NASA made very sure to go back and see what happened, how to correct it. And uh, in case you're wondering, they said, let's just add an extra oxygen tank to the next mission just in case any problems should occur. Well, by February of 1971, Apollo 14 was ready to return to the moon and did so successfully despite a few problems of its own. It still was not trivial to land on the moon. This was an extraordinarily difficult task, even though it had been done twice already. In this case, it was one of the earliest Mercury astronauts, in fact, the first Mercury astronaut to fly, Alan Shepard, the first American in space, piloted the lunar module Antares down to the surface despite a couple problems. His computer on board was ready to signal an abort, and they had to find a way to work through that with mission control. And as they approached the lunar surface, the landing radar wasn't working to give them their proper altitude. But they were able to get that to work and successfully land. And by the way, for you golfers out there, Alan Shepard smuggled aboard a golf ball and he sliced it. But he later said he hit it for miles and miles. <laughs> now you might think, come on, really? But in the weak lunar gravity, you never know. So somewhere on the moon's a golf ball. We don't know where. Probably in the sand trap, right? <laughs> by Apollo 15, the summer of 1971 returned for a much more ambitious mission. Number one, the lunar module was outfitted with extra fuel, power, the ability to stay longer, and as you can see here, the first car on the moon, the lunar rover, a very special electric vehicle that the astronauts could use to travel much farther from the lunar module and do much more science. By this point in time, our stays on the moon had grown more confident, and they were able to, again, give the astronauts additional tasks. Geologists, of course, on Earth were very excited that we had 
human beings on the moon and they could direct them to various formations, gather certain samples, and spend much more time. So as you can see here, they spent three days on the moon. It spent three moonwalks, several hours each. Uh, one of the highlights of this mission, you see in the lower right corner, what later came to be called the Genesis rock. Why that? Because this is one of the oldest samples we have from the moon. It turned out to be over four billion years old. We suspect it very likely was part of the original crust of the moon. And so scientists were ecstatic, of course, to bring that home and analyze that and learn about it. As we'll see later on, the other samples told us some other things as well. Apollo 16 returns to the moon sometime later. And again, here is where science continues to grow and mature. You can see the lunar rover there. John Young and Charlie Duke spent 71 hours on the surface, collected even more lunar samples, and really did some outstanding work in a very different location on the moon here. By the way, I may have overlooked to mention that while our astronauts, of course, are exploring the surface of the moon, I mentioned earlier there was one astronaut remaining in lunar orbit with the command and service module. And they were not idle by any means, but they began to do some very useful science of mapping and different types of imaging and picture taking. So all in all, by this point in time, the Apollo missions had matured to the point where, again, scientists were thrilled to have uh, the astronauts there at work with them. They could be in radio contact with them, go over to this area, pick up that sample, go do this, maybe do that. Very exciting time for Apollo. Great capability was ours to be on the moon. Unfortunately, it seemed that after these earlier missions, public interest began to wane a bit. And therefore, congressional interest <laughs> began to wane a bit. NASA had originally planned to fly missions all the way through Apollo 20. But Congress decided not to fund those final three missions. So Apollos 18, 19, and 20 were canceled, even though the rockets were built, the spacecraft were built, the astronauts were trained. And as a result, our final mission to the moon was Apollo 17 in December of 1972. By the way, the commander here, Gene Cernan, you might be interested to know, grew up right here in Bellwood. And if you were to visit uh, Triton Community College, you might know they have the Cernan Space Center. So I'll make a little plug for them if you'd like to stop there. They have a real nice visitor gallery where they have some memorabilia from Gene Cernan's uh, space flight to the moon. On this final mission, you can see a spectacular night launch of the Saturn V. They weren't just trying to show off. The mission dictated this by the timing of when they wanted to get to the spot on the moon at a certain time. You had to launch at that particular time, but it was a pretty dramatic launch. You can see one of the pictures here as they're exploring a very deep crater. And on this final mission, NASA decided to send a trained geologist Yes, he was still a skilled pilot, but his primary vocation was as a geologist, and he was of great use on the lunar surface, Jack Schmidt. Little did we know, when Gene Cernan stepped off the moon, it would be over 50 years before we might return. We obviously still have not. So that's a nice synopsis, I think, of the missions. Let's touch briefly on what we learned Obviously, the astronauts picked up a lot of rocks. Also, what we call the lunar regolith, or kind of think of it as not so much soil, but as the fine-grained material on the surface. And they even drilled down and pounded core samples to get subsurface material. I'll just keep this simple. There were two main types of rocks found. Basaltic rock is basically frozen lava. That told us the surface of the moon had been molten as lava at some point in time, and later solidified. In fact, if you step out at night and look up at the moon, you see some little dark areas on there? That's what you're seeing. They're called the lunar mare. And these are regions where long ago huge impacts crashed into the moon, melted the surface, essentially, and then it refroze in a much smoother state, kind of erasing the existing craters from those regions. The other major type, the breccias, these are more of a composite where when you have an impact, you would think, well, surely that's going to destroy rock and break it apart, but the heat and pressure would also fuse it together. And you can see a couple examples here of those as well. I think you were able to see a few of those at one of our displays. So again, I cannot go into the detail here of what we've learned. I will tell you this, that our lunar samples changed our understanding of the moon. 
Prior to that, we didn't really have a really good single solid theory of the moon's formation in history, but Apollo samples provided that. Geologists were able to say the moon almost certainly did not form on its own. Based on the composition and ages of those samples, we now feel pretty sure that there was an enormous impact to the very early Earth that basically sprayed matter out into a region that then reformed into the moon. And so there's much more detail to that, but the point being, lunar samples tremendously improved our knowledge of the moon, not only today, but its history, its formation over time. Well, besides the science, what was it all about? What was the meaning of Apollo? If you'll indulge me for a moment, I want to just make a few points. Certainly, there's no question it was an incredible technological advancement, wasn't it? In nine short years, we went from no humans in space to walking on the moon. This took, first of all, tremendous commitment on the part of the United States, didn't it? Planning, resources, technological development, oh my goodness, so much went on. Over 400,000 people worked on the Apollo project. Imagine that, various uh, places, various ways. But I want to make one other point, I'll take just a moment. And that was that Apollo, I think, showed us what we could do when we put our minds to it in a peaceful purpose, in a peaceful way. Today, in recent years, there's been some skepticism about science. Occasionally we'll hear that. People are not quite so willing to accept what we can learn from science. And I think we maybe should look back at Apollo and be reminded of what science can do for us if we use it wisely, if we use it properly for the right goals, the right aims. We can accomplish great things when we set our mind to it. But again, are we setting our minds on the right things and using science wisely? So I think it is faced, uh, fair to call Apollo perhaps our greatest adventure to have accomplished that, again, in such a short time with the technology available at the time. So by now, of course, the question though remains, when will we return? Many of us have been waiting for many years. And we wonder, when will we return? We've asked that question many times. Well, the good news is you may have heard more talk about returning to the moon recently. So I think that is good news. But the question is, will it actually play out? So let's talk about that for just a minute here. What is the next chapter in space flight? Well, you might know that NASA has been directed to return to the moon. And they've actually been given a mandate to do that by 2024. Will this plan succeed? The reason we ask that question is because there have been previous plans. If you go back to the early 1990s, then President Bush directed NASA to go back to the moon. If you go back to the early to mid 2000s, then President Bush directed NASA to go back to the moon. But neither of those plans materialized, did they? Well, currently NASA has a new program it's calling Artemis. Why Artemis? Artemis was the twin sister of Apollo. Seems appropriate. You can see four major components of this new program. The Space Launch System, we'll talk about that new booster there on the left for a minute. A new command and service module called Orion. Our first lunar gateway. Okay, we mentioned that earlier in our discussion. And of course, a lander. So how will these pieces Take us back to the moon. Let's look at them each individually. The Space Launch System is NASA's new large booster. Most of you know for many years we flew the Space Shuttle. Well, NASA figured that, you know what, we have proven well-known technology from the Space Shuttle program. Why not use it? Why reinvent the wheel, so to speak? So what you see here is essentially a Space Shuttle fuel tank that might be familiar to many of you. At its bottom are four space shuttle main engines. NASA still has several dozen of these available and the familiar solid rocket boosters. So this new space launch system is under development. The problem is it's been behind schedule <laughs> and it's faced difficulties. We had hoped it would be flying by now, but it's still got a little ways to go. We suspect it'll still take a little bit longer before it gets off the ground. After that first main 
uh, stage. There would be an upper stage, as you'll see here in just a second. So we hope very soon here we'll see the Space Launch System, or SLS, fly. How about Orion, the new command and service modules? These would be patterned somewhat after the Apollo design, however, be larger, more sophisticated, more capable, able to have four astronauts aboard for an extended period of time. Now you can see, of course, a little different scenario here. The service module looks a little different. I think NASA did a wise thing here as well. They invited the European Space Agency to join us on this new venture, and I think that makes a lot of sense. In recent years, NASA has worked with the European Space Agency on other pro uh, programs. It's been very, very successful, so why not invite their expertise, their assistance, and their help financially? <laughs> and so this, these spacecraft are under development as well. They're progressing well. They're preparing to be tested here very shortly. And so the first few missions are being planned. The Artemis mission would be an unmanned mission to take the Orion spacecraft on a trajectory out of Earth orbit and around the moon and likely into lunar orbit for several days. Currently, it is scheduled for mid to late 2021. Got to tell you, that date has slipped a couple times already uh, and may well slip again, we don't know. But the first crewed mission, the Artemis II mission, we suspect won't be any sooner than 2023. Here the astronauts would take Orion again to the moon. They would perform that translunar injection and head to the moon on a free return trajectory. Just in case there were any problems, they would be able to return to Earth with no further effort on their part. And so this hopefully will again play out as well. After that, NASA might be in a position to attempt the Artemis III mission, perhaps a landing, but I'll get into the details of that here for just another few minutes. Okay, would you like to get a little taste of what that may look and feel like? Let's take a look at the launch. <laughs> 
Well, hopefully we'll see that take place in the very near future. We'd be very excited to once again see Earth rise, wouldn't you? I know I would be. NASA's proposed a new component to traveling to the moon. It's called the Gateway. And Gateway would be, again, a small lunar orbiting station placed in a very strategically planned orbit around the moon, a little differently than was done with Apollo here. It would be a very elliptical orbit, as you can see. They're what we call a halo orbit, where we come in closer to the moon and then come out much farther from the moon. Why would they do that? Well, this will have a number of advantages. It would allow approaching spacecraft from Earth to dock with it much easier than going into low lunar orbit. Again, NASA envisions a longer-term presence around the moon. Rather than just get to the surface and come back again, the gateway would provide additional capability over time. As you can see here, scientific research. You could store supplies and fuel there. It would be a communications relay. And again, in the longer term, NASA envisions this as an important point to be able to send missions even farther from the moon. So this has been not only discussed, but already adopted and designed. NASA is already working on the gateway. There's been some discussion about its uh, validity, but the point is they're moving ahead with it. NASA should be given some credit for moving ahead with very definite plans. Ultimately, of course, you got to land on the moon, right? And here NASA had started work on a lander years ago, but that lander was uh, shelved essentially. So now they're turning to commercial partners. They're putting out to some of the nation's aerospace companies and accepting bids for lunar landers. How would that work? It would have to obviously be integrated in with Orion, the space launch system. All that would need to be done. So there's much work to be done to try to accomplish a landing by 2024. Will lunar exploration resume? I think the answer is eventually. There are many who aren't so sure how realistic the year 2024 is to make that happen. Others have said, well, NASA did it in nine years during the 1960. Why can't we do it now? We'll see what happens. I will tell you this, one of the major factors, as you can well imagine, as we talked about before, is the funding. If Congress will fund NASA's plans, NASA will carry them out. But what would it take? to get back by 2024. Currently, NASA has a set budget. To achieve this 2024 date, they would need approximately somewhere in the range, several billion to perhaps as much as eight billion more dollars each year. Now, the current administration has asked for an additional two billion. You can see that's not gonna be enough initially. So ultimately, again, it's gonna heavily depend on the funding. So it's an exciting time. NASA has definite plans. They are definitely working towards returning to the moon. It's always still a question of will everything uh, be provided for NASA to be able to do that. So stay tuned for that exciting next chapter. We hope that the adventure will continue. So I'd like to thank you for being with us tonight to commemorate mankind's greatest adventure, Apollo Reaches the Moon. At this point, I would be glad to entertain questions that you might have had during the discussion. And we'll have some microphones available. I see one hand over here we could start with. And if you raise your hand and I call on you, then we'll get your question. Let me start over here first, and then we'll come back over there second. OK, please go ahead. OK. Um, oh, that's loud. Um, <laughs> what percentage of the moon have we discovered? I'm sorry, what was the age of the moon discovered? No, uh, the percentage. 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 She's asking what percentage of the moon have we explored? Or what percentage of the moon have we explored? A very small percentage. If you can imagine much of the surface land area of the Earth and you had just five or seven missions to land there and drive around for a few miles, have you explored Earth? No. So we've explored a very, very small portion of the moon. Well, no more reason to go back and learn more, right? Okay, thank you. Is there a question over here, I think? Uh, yes. Uh, so what were the Russians doing during that time? Good question. I wanted to not go too much over time, but the Russians actually were hard at work on a lunar program. They were much more secretive about it. And only in recent years have we come to learn that they did build a giant rocket 
called the N1 rocket, if you go home and look that up. They did have one major disadvantage. You saw our Apollo Saturn V booster had five enormous engines on that first stage. Each engine developing one and a half million pounds of thrust. You add that together, you get over seven million pounds of thrust. The Russians did not have a large engine. What did they do instead? They tried 23 small engines. And you can imagine the complexity of trying to get 23 rocket engines working. They attempted to launch that booster four times. All four times it blew up, once on the pad. And it was almost like a small nuclear explosion. So while they were working on it and wouldn't admit it at the time, it's become clear they were trying very hard and simply couldn't pull it off. So again, you look back and you do have to give the United States credit for being able to develop the, the proper engine and, and booster to, to take us to the moon. Okay, I see a hand there, and then there's one up here as well. We can get that one first. Right there, and then one back there, go ahead. Do you think that the Apollo program was mankind's greatest achievement, and why? I guess you have to define the word achievement. There are many fields where we've achieved wondrous things, uh, the medical field, um, other fields. I certainly think it was our greatest technological achievement in nine short years to go from, again, rockets that blew up <laughs> to landing men safely on the moon. Because it's hard for me to share with you in an hour, hour and a half, how much went into the Apollo missions. Again, it's easy to say, oh, there's a lot of technology, but again, the propulsion, the guidance, the communication, the tracking, the recovery, all of that had to be developed. So yeah, I do think it certainly ranks right up in there to, in the top of our achievements. Okay, I think there was a hand there, and then we'll come back up in the front here. One there? Yes, uh, in, in the um, video you had of the Apollo 11 uh, lander, when it was just before it was starting to land, it looked like it was going over another vehicle. What was that? It was, was that going previous, over another vehicle? It, it appears to be look like another lander, or I didn't understand the uh, point of view of the um, of the camera. Keep going. The, the Apollo 11 uh, video you had. Oh, the video. The video you have of the Apollo 11 landing. Oh, I see. Okay, the actual model. So no, there was, if I understand your question rightly, the lunar module landed itself, but there was no other vehicle there? Is that what's the question? Well, there, there was. Uh, it was one, as, as it was coming down, as it was coming down, it looked like there was another... Uh, oh, 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 during the video. During the video. At yeah. the very end, in the simulation, they were showing you where he would eventually land. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, I misunderstood you, but okay. yeah, as, as on the right-hand picture you saw, you could see a lunar module. Yeah, that was just a simulation. Sorry, computer graphics. <laughs> Okay, was there a hand over here? And then I think one over there, we'll go next. So how did they get the car like from Earth to space? I know, <laughs> it wasn't easy. Can you imagine a car that could fold up? Pretty cool, huh? So in the lunar module, in the base, you have the main rocket engine, you have the legs, of course, you can imagine there's fuel tanks. There was a little extra space. And what they did was build it in a way that it would fold up on there very carefully. There's pictures you can find. When the astronauts got out there, they pulled a little rope and the, the car would fold out and fall down and the legs would open up and your car would work. <laughs> so it was pretty clever. They were pretty smart rocket engineers back then. Okay, uh, I think we have one there. Right? Hi, Professor. Hi. Um, my question, so how does the technology that they used then compare to the technology that we have available now? That is a good question. I'm glad you asked it because I didn't really emphasize that. I didn't put her up to it, but I'll give you some extra points for that, okay? Probably most of us realize that back then the technology compared to today was very primitive, frankly. Let's just be honest. We had television. We had telephones. We did not have digital technology. We did not have any digital communication. And that also is one of the great things that came from the space program. At the time, there were those who questioned, why are we spending billions of dollars to put a man on the moon when this is wrong and this problem exists and all that? And while those problems are certainly very valid and we need to address those, think of what we have today, and many of us didn't live back then to know the difference, 
Today we all walk around with more computing power in our pocket than all of Mission Control had. <laughs> okay. I can easily call somebody up or text them or email them on the other side of the planet without thinking much about it, can I? That didn't exist back in the 1960s. Where did it come from? It came from that, indirectly perhaps, but computers and technology were developed for the space program and miniaturized to the point that some entrepreneurs realized this could have a application for real people in the real world, in the everyday life, and that's where early PCs began. Some of you remember back in the 1970s into the 1980s. We moved away from you know, videotape into digital technology. We moved into, and obviously that's where we're at today. So thanks for the question. We've come a long way, haven't we? I thought I saw a hand over there, and then we'll get one more over here, sir, in the front. Oh, thank you. Yes, sir. So why do you think they named the original moon projects Apollo, even though he's a god of the sun instead of Artemis? Who's the goddess of the moon, and now we're doing the Artemis projects instead of vice versa? <laughs> what? What did I do? Was that in, uh... You know, I gotta say, I always pride myself at being able to answer just about any question. <laughs> I think someone finally found one. I didn't have an answer. Why did they name it that? I would have to dig into that. I don't know the exact reason. It seemed like the right name at the time. Apparently, they wanted to go with the male god rather than the female, perhaps. I didn't do it. It wasn't my idea. I disavow any acceptance, but sir, here. Have I um, heard that the Chinese have landed something on the back of the moon? They have. So the Chinese landed a unmanned uh, vehicle on the far side of the moon that we don't see from Earth. You probably know we only see one side of the moon. It's kind of gravitationally locked. And so that brings up a good point. Uh, someone said earlier, I think uh, Dr. Talger said that, you know, we're not the only player. Do we want to be second or third place? Other nations are pursuing their space flight. And China has publicly said they will eventually send people to the moon. So, um, some of you heard me quote uh, John Kennedy, of course, he had that vision of America leading the space age, and we've done that, but we need to continue, maintain that lead because there are other players, okay? I think there was a hand back there. Do we have a microphone over there? And then, or else did I miss? There's one over here we could take. Okay, please, sir. Okay, so here's a question. I, I guess um, Aldrin and uh, Collins, just recently made the news by dissing the uh, Space Launch System. I guess in addition to being over uh, budget, it's also not reusable, and I guess the European Design Command Module's only got about a third the power that Apollo had. So given those uh, issues, uh, if it doesn't happen, what do you think about SpaceX and Blue Origin? What do you think will happen there? Very good question. In recent years, we've seen private companies step up, haven't they? SpaceX is very prominent, and I give them a lot of credit for their, well, aggressive approach to moving into space. And I think that has spurred NASA. Um, I will say this, that NASA often has been at the mercy of their budget. For many years, as they flew the space shuttle, they were only given enough money to fly the space shuttle. They could not invest in a future vehicle. And tragically, that ultimately led to uh, not having any new vehicle. And there's been this now number of, of years, period of time, when we, the United States does not have a vehicle. So the problem being that each administration often comes in and says, we want you to do this. Again, back in the early 2000s, the administration said, you should go back to the moon. And they said, we can do that. They started working on it that way. Another administration came in and said, eh, you're over budget, you're behind schedule. Let's go, let's go to Mars. And that sounds exciting, right? Something new. Well, that has turned out to be an enormous challenge, and we've kind of maybe thought, well, maybe we should go back to the... So the problem has been that NASA is often at the mercy, if you will, of their budget, which often begins with an administration or Congress or both, and it's too short-sighted. There's been a proposal that we need to have a body, a committee, whatever you want to call it, a supranational body that would say, look, we are above such 
short-term things. We will give NASA X amount of money each year, but we will give them the ability to supersede the short-term and let them build longer-term projects. So I think SpaceX has done a great thing, other companies as well, Blue Virgin, and uh, they can certainly work with NASA. NASA realizes their capability, their potential. It's great to see that. I hope they do continue to work uh, together more in the future. Yeah. Where were we next? Over here? Great, great presentation. Thank you. So thank you. Um, you mentioned the next uh, trip to the moon. And my question is, what questions are we looking to answer in the next trips to the moon? And how important is that versus, say, questions that we answer by exploring Mars or the rest of the galaxy or you know, beyond the solar system? Good question. Let me start by saying it is uh, obviously extremely expensive and extremely difficult to send humans into space, isn't it? Many scientists say, you know, we could take a lot of that money and use it for unmanned or unpiloted craft to explore the solar system. We've done that successfully. In fact, I forgot to tell you, I'll make my quick pitch here to please come back and see me in September, October rather, for my next lecture on, new, whoops, didn't want to go there. Let's go back there. In October, come back, we're going to talk about NASA's uh, New Horizons mission again. But back to your question, what are we going to gain, I think, from going back to the moon? As our first question asks, we really spent very little time there, gathered very little information, relatively speaking. We not only want to understand the moon, that's a, a good scientific goal, but the moon has many clues about the Earth. How did the Earth form? Why is the Earth the way it is? Think about it, Earth's the only planet in the inner solar system with a large moon. Mercury, Venus, Mars, they don't have large moons. Why does Earth have one? Well, I mentioned our theory is that there was this impact and so forth. So studying the moon means learning about the Earth and learning about the early solar system and other planets. And you might say, well, that all sounds like great science. There's also, of course, the technology development. There's also the urge for humans to explore. And quite frankly, I think we are at the stage where going back to the, going rather to Mars might be a little more than we can chew right now. We gotta be careful to take this in stages. Uh, as, our, as our visiting uh, Dr. Chaudhry said, well, it would be a tremendous task, several years to go back to Mars. So there's not only much science to learn, but to gradually and safely move out into space, the moon is probably the next logical step for the time being, okay? I thought I saw a hand way over here somewhere, right? Yeah, I missed one over here. And then, is there one over here? Sure, over there. Okay, so when do you think that Apollo 100 is going to take in? <laughs> I'm thinking like, like the, like, I don't know, like the year is like 3018 or something. I don't know. Yeah, I think it's gonna be a while. Yeah. I think Apollo, I think they finished. They're gonna go on to this new one now call Artemis, because we've learned so much more and we can build better, smarter spacecraft if uh, NASA's given the resources to do that along with its other partners. Well, is there one over here? Are we any closer to, uh, to the space elevator? So the space elevator was an interesting concept. And to my knowledge, I haven't followed it closely, but it has not been pursued in recent years. The idea here was, well, what if you put a spacecraft into orbit, like we've seen, and you drop a, well, extremely strong cable down to the surface. How would that work? Sounds kind of neat in principle. If you're orbiting, you drop this thing down, can I just climb up it somehow? Is that the general concept that you're thinking of? There's some problems with that, as you can imagine. And the surface, at first, it sounds real simple and sounds good, but whatever that thing is made out of can easily be influenced by the extreme velocity of an orbiting spacecraft at 17,000 miles an hour. If it is in the slightest bit conductive material, any type of, you're gonna generate a tremendous amount of electricity flowing through this thing as it sweeps through the Earth's magnetic field. So again, I haven't followed it closely. I don't know every detail. I do know uh, that it was looked at for a number of years and then it was pretty much uh, set to the side. So. Who knows, maybe someday we'll come back to it, but to my knowledge, we're not pursuing it right now. Anyone else, one here, front middle? You guys have good questions. Uh, thanks for the good presentation, and if I could 
answer that other young man's question about sure. uh, Apollo and Artemis. They were twins, and they were both noted for their bravery, but Apollo was reputed to be uh, a great adventurer on top of everything else, so that could have something to do with it. There you go. So Apollo was the adventurer. So we talked a lot about the technology, which I love hearing, but what... What could you give us as far as insights about the personalities of the astronauts? We, we've heard stories of there was alarms going off and they might cancel them and they've mentioned in later years that, oh, we're not going back. We're, we're figuring some way to get down there and complete our mission. What, what uh, fun stories or what interesting anecdotes can you give us for some insight into their personalities? All the astronauts were uh, Incredible pilots, first of all, that's why they were selected. They were, of course, all individuals. They all had their own personality. Um, I can relate a couple of anecdotes, I guess, uh, early on. Uh, during a Gemini mission, the booster ignited, and the launch team cried out, lift off! And the commander said, we didn't go anywhere. <laughs> and the booster shut down. Now, normally, you're sitting on top of this high explosive that already ignited you would want to escape from that, but this astronaut, Wally Shira, just very calmly and coolly sat there and did not abort. He saved the spacecraft, he saved the booster, and some weeks later they were able to launch him back into space. So there was that. Neil Armstrong <laughs> uh, was known for his Gemini mission. He's up in space, and for a brief few moments they're out of touch with the ground, and they have made one of these first missions, I said, where they dock together with another rocket. Well, the spacecraft starts spinning. So imagine yourself doing this. And by the time they got in touch with the ground, he says, we're having a serious problem here. We're spinning once per second. And the ground is like, Armstrong, again, calmly and coolly realized, first of all, let me undock with that rocket, see if that's the problem. It wasn't. He realizes it's our, my spacecraft. I better shut off all the thrust on this thing. But to gain control of it, I have to activate the backup system, which is only used when it's time to come home. But he didn't have much choice, did he? So he did that, and he regained control of the spacecraft. And afterwards, they sorted through it. But the point was, he was calm and cool and expert enough to know what to do and to do it quickly. Those men almost blacked out. And if they black out, that's it. There was, there'll be no way to save them. So they literally almost died. Of course, they did have to come back down after that. But the point is, these were expert pilots. In fact, I have an idea. We have somebody here that actually knew a few of the astronauts. I wonder if we can impose on them to add a comment to that. Can we maybe get a microphone over here? A good friend of mine, Charlie, when he was younger, knew some of the astronauts, Frank Borman and others. Charlie, could you add anything for us to that? I'd be happy to. Uh, cousin Joey. This is my cousin <laughs> Joey. <laughs> You know him as uh, Secret Professor Del Santo, but uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, I grew up as the son of a test pilot. Uh, my father and I, was he was a, uh, uh, a general in the Air Force, and uh, I grew up at Edwards Air Force Base, so he, uh, he was uh, a test pilot there. He and I have recently completed a book, uh, including a chapter uh, about uh, much of which uh, Joey has talked about today. Uh, about some of the personalities, uh, so there I am, I'm only, uh, I'm eight years old to 12 years old growing up there, but I knew many of the children and many of the parents of the astronauts at Edwards, and much of what uh, Professor Del Santo has said today is quite true of them, but a couple other aspects I think is, is really true. These are all talented, educated, uh, extremely well-trained individuals, but they also had a very interesting relationship with risk. Uh, what they are doing seems wildly risky to all of us, but they, uh, they were very comfortable with calculated risk. We all know there's a big difference between gambling and taking calculated risks. Well, that's what all of these individuals had uh, in spades. They practiced, they rehearsed, uh, they were well coached, but they, they encountered as test pilots, first of all, risky situations and they worked themselves out. The Armstrong story is a wonderful one because he was able, in that situation, he learned that situation, frankly, as a test pilot. Yeah. They encounter all sorts of uh, difficult things there. What my father did there, interestingly, because uh, we may have some young astronauts in the audience, and I think this is pretty, pretty important to listen to this. Uh, my father was a big man. He played football at, uh, at West Point. His best friend then and his best friend today is Frank Borman, who's the, uh, the mission commander of Apollo 8. 
Frank's a diminutive individual. <laughs> uh, and it turns out that uh, what my father was doing was flying the big bomber, the B-52 at Edwards, and some of the early flights into lower space were done by the X-15. Many of you may have been familiar with the X-15. It was hung up underneath the wing of a B-52, and, um, and it would then be dropped. The 52 would go up to about 45 or 50,000 feet. They're going about 500 miles an hour because they get them up that high. Uh, the X-15 had limited fuel, so it needed to get up a, a little assistance to get into space. Well, many of the people that we've uh, heard about today, many of the early astronauts learned uh, flying with the X-15. The X-15 was, was the precursor to the space shuttle uh, because it went up into space and it landed, free-falling, and landed at, uh, at Edwards uh, on the dry lake beds there. So anyway, for the young astronauts here, it's important to recognize that you have to be well-educated, you have to be motivated. These were all highly uh, motivated individuals. You need to be comfortable with risk. You need to think coolly uh, when you have uh, difficult situations. And most importantly, you need to be short. <laughs> <laughs> no, no big guys get into these little cockpits. Very good. Thank you, Charlie. All right, we have one more there and a hand there. So over here or there, either one. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah, so I'd like to make a few additional the... comments about the, the uh, professional pilot personality and of course, the astronauts were the best of the best, but every airline pilot and most first responders, police and fire personnel, have a very similar personality. I have a friend who's a psychologist who did studies on first responders, and she said, you can't, we can't tell the difference between a professional pilot and first responder even with the best psychological tests. So it's kind of a thing of, of self-selection. Okay, thank you. Question over here? Yeah. My question is about the rocket technology for the space launch system. Is that basically a true rocket where it does have action-reaction response, much like our current level of rockets? Is there any talk about atomic rockets, which may not be precisely the same type of result in the physics? Okay, good question. So the, an the short answer is yes, it is still a traditional chemical fuel rocket. It's based, uh, the SLS is based on space shuttle technology. It uses the space shuttle main engines, the space shuttle solid rocket boosters. Again, well known, well understood, well proven technology. Um, in the past, as you mentioned, other technologies have been looked at. Could we? Years ago, they talked about you know, atomic or nuclear rockets. That is feasible in principle, but to my knowledge, has not been pursued far enough for any uh, significant uh, usage right now. Okay. Any remaining questions? One more we'll take. There's one over here, I think, please. Were, were the um, Apollo astronauts, were they all mili former military? Not all of them. Many were. They received their training and a lot of their experience in the military. Yes, it's true. Neil Armstrong was not. Neil Armstrong was not, and a few of the others. Um, but again, as I think Charlie mentioned, they were all not only highly skilled, highly trained, but these were men that were willing to accept the calculated risk uh, given uh, the best that could be done to minimize it. Okay. Well, thank you all very much for being with us tonight. I hope to see you again.